Okay, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? That's all good. I like that. Welcome to City Light Church, where everyone is welcome, nobody is perfect, and anything is possible. And we believe that we've been called to such, for such a time as this, right now, and all the world that's going through, the, all the things that we are going through in the world, to move people from where they are to where God wants them to be. We get to be a part of that mission on earth. I'm so glad that you're here today. We've come to glorify and worship and lift high in the name of Jesus. I hope that you came ready to do that. It's going to be a blessing to you. It is. It is. absolutely is. And I'm so encouraged and excited. Our friend Erskine is back to lead us in worship all the way from Nashville. We're glad you're here today. And so let's do this. Let's all stand to our feet and let's just put our hearts in a proper position before Christ and welcome him even now. And Jesus, we just want to say thank you for the cross. We say thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. Thank you for forgiveness we could never earn. And thank you for the chance to worship you because of who you are and what you've done. It's our joy to worship you as our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.
is good. Amen. So good to be here this morning. As he continues to put the broken parts of our life together, we give him glory. We give him praise and honor. And I search the Nothing is better. 
Let's sing that chorus again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. Amen. Oh, there's nothing. end with these words as we think about God's goodness in our lives and how he calls us friend I'm not afraid to show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend We get a chance to declare our love for Christ Jesus. And even in these days of difficulty and change and stress and strife, we get to put a flag in the, the ground and say, we will follow the Lord. Amen. I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God that never failed will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God that never lay is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will give you out in the lowest valley. Yes, I will. Bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Come on. Count on one thing. I count on one thing. I'm the same God that never fails will not fail me now. But you won't fail me now. In the waiting. I'm the same God that never lays. Working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will live you right. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing with joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, my days, oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will, cause I choose to pray.
day for all my days. Yes, I will. All my days. All my days. One more time. All my days. Oh, yes, I will. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that upon Christ there is a solid rock and all of the ground is sinking sand. And so we, we plant a flag this morning. We say for all of our days, yes, we will. We will follow you no matter what. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to guide us this morning, strengthen us as a result of us singing praise and being together and having the opportunity to broadcast this to the ends of the earth to proclaim the glory of King Jesus. Would you glorify yourself now in the preaching and proclamation of your word? And all God's people said together, amen. Amen, amen and amen. Hey, you say hello to someone next to you. Let's give a little COVID-friendly high five. So I'm excited about today. I want to welcome all of our extended family joining us online right now. Uh, uh, just a, a shout out to Kristen tuning in from Atlanta and uh, Lauren tuning in from Jacksonville, I think, hopefully, I don't know, we'll see. Um, John here in Gainesville, we're glad that you're here in George down in Tampa. Hey, we've got extended family all over the place and it's a joy to come together as one family and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today. I'm just going to move this just real fast. So, uh, I feel like there's somebody standing right next to me. <laughs> Give me the elbow. <laughs> and hey, can we thank Erskine for uh, leading us in worship this morning? Yeah, that was, it was such a, such a joy uh, to have him here. And on the way out, if you're in the room, make sure you check out his, his music stand back there and buy a shirt from him, you know, buy two shirts. Let's, let's show a little um, love to our Christian brother who is, hey, you know this, right? Christian artists have been really restricted in their ability to, to do what they do, to serve Christ and make a living. So let, let's show a little love to him. And if you're online, make sure that you check out his website. Not right now, later. Uh, check out his website. <laughs> and uh, purchased some of his music. We're glad that he was here with us today. And I was just talking to him um, before church and just, to, just his heart for the Lord. Um, good man, I'm glad that he's here. Today we're wrapping up our series entitled Emotions. And I know just wrapping up a series is sad in and of itself, but all good things uh, must come to, to an end. So many of you have told me, whether you posted it online or told me in person that Man, this has been a timely series. It has been good to talk about these kinds of things in the context of the scriptures. What does the Bible have to say? What, what is the example that Jesus gives us about emotions, even this morning? In our prayer time, before we kicked off the service, we've got our serve teams, and, and we were praying together, and in the circle we were saying, this is a time when people need to be talking about our emotions, and we need to be talking about mental health, and we need to be talking about depression, and we're going through it. The world is going through uh, the, the emotions. And the impact of what we've been walking through over the last year, we don't know the toll that it's going to take on us long term. We don't know the toll that it's going to have on our children. But the one thing we do know is that Jesus tells us, I care about you. I care about what you're going through. I care about how you're coping. I care about you. Cast all your cares on me because I care about you. And we, we know this also about Jesus, that he's not just saying this from some removed place, like he didn't say it from heaven. No, he came down on earth. He experienced life and temptations all the ways that we did. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says that we have a high priest who understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same temptations and testings that you and I do, and yet he did not sin. So we go to Jesus and we say, hey, I'm counting on you caring for me. I'm bringing my cares to the foot of the cross. So we've been looking at his emotions and asking the question, what is your example to us, Jesus? If God, if, God, if you created us to be emotional creatures, if it's part of the human experience, 
How can we feel, how can we express in a godly way things like anxiety, things like fear, anger? Is there a, is there a scriptural way to handle our anger, this, this sadness, this unsettledness? We don't want to be dominated by them. We don't want to be ruled by them. We, we don't want to see the world through their lenses. We don't want to be controlled or sinned because of them. We want to know, Jesus, how did you who were, you were 100% God and 100% man, how did you handle them? And in week two, we asked this personal question. If we all did a, a, a survey of the soul, right, our own personal survey, what would one word be that would describe your emotional state right now? Just a quick survey of, of the heart, right? And, and some people said things to me like, man, I, I just feel numb, Josh. Others told me, I feel let down. Man, if I'm honest, I'm angry. I'm angry and I'm a little depressed too. And is, is it okay to say that? Is it okay to tell you that I've, these are the ways I'm feeling? I feel betrayed. I feel anxious. I feel afraid. And, and now I told you that for me personally, over the last 12 months, I've wrestled more with anger and sadness than perhaps any other season in my life. Very true emotions, and if there was one emotional word that would sum up for me my state of being, I would say unsettled. I've felt very unsettled over the last so many months. It just feels like everything is shifting, the ground is changing, the world isn't the same, and everything um, beneath my feet feels unsettling to me. And so what I think would be helpful as we wrap up this series is to recognize that we're not going to approach our emotions with a one and done uh, style, like one hat fits all. We're not gonna treat our very real, uh, ever-changing emotions with a single approach. And we were, we were talking about this this morning in our prayer circle, how important it is uh, that we, we have different places where we're drawing from um, to help us emotionally. So what I don't want you to do, I don't want you to think, okay, you know what, Josh preached four sermons in February on emotions, so voila, you know, I'm, I'm cured, <laughs> that that would be, no, don't do that. Uh, we're we're going to take a holistic approach uh, to our emotions. And we're not going to let pride, gentlemen, right? We're not going to let pride stop us from talking to our friends, from talking to our father, from talking to our feelings. We're not, we're not going to let pride keep us from visiting the doctor and asking some questions about my anxiety. And, and maybe he needs to adjust your diet or maybe he needs to adjust a prescription or, or give you a, a regimen of exercise and, and, and help you out that way. Maybe you need to spend some time talking to someone who counsels about these things, who's got some experience, who can help you out. This isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. All right, we're, we're looking at scripture, and I think that we can all agree right now that this is a very emotional time in history. Just so many emotions, and today we're going to talk about an emotion of Jesus that you probably haven't thought of too much, the sadness of Jesus. I don't, I, you know, I don't think about that very often, you know, was, was Jesus sad, and uh and I, and I felt everything in the room just kind of drop right there. We're also going to talk about the joy of Jesus, okay? Uh, but we're going to talk about the sadness of Jesus. It's a very real thing. The shortest verse in all the Bible was Jesus wept. Jesus experienced sadness. And just this week, I was reading in an article uh, that said this alarming rate, 64% of young adults right now are feeling sad or depressed due to the circumstances around the pandemic. 64%, that's, that's a high number. I spoke with a friend this week on the phone, another friend in person, two, two different people, who both told me, man, I am feeling sad, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? And we just prayed right there on the phone or the other person uh, in person. And isn't it comforting to know that Jesus experienced, that Jesus felt sadness too? And the good news is that if we look at what made him sad, perhaps we can discover what brought him joy. And so I pray today that you hear God's word, that you believe God's word, that you receive God's word, and that you apply God's word, that we allow it to build our faith, that we allow it to change us, that we allow ourselves to walk out of here holding on to a truth in the middle of a storm. 
as we contrast these two very real emotions in Jesus' life, his sadness and his joy. Would you pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for your help for us as listeners, that we would be doers of your word and not hearers only. Set, set some of us free today. Set some of us free. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's, there's so many things as I look at scripture that brought Jesus joy. That's encouraging news. There's so many things. Um, when the hurting were healed, we see that that brought Jesus joy. When the rejected were loved, we see that that brought Jesus joy. When sinners were forgiven, that absolutely brought Jesus joy. In fact, all of heaven is filled with joy when a sinner is forgiven. But occasionally, Jesus would cry. Occasionally, he was sad. And so the question I'm asking is, what made Jesus sad? Why is it that Jesus cried? And I think it's a helpful question. And we're going to look at an instance when Jesus cried that's in the book of Luke. It's, and uh, this is not going to be our primary text this morning, but it is a good one. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41, we're told that Jesus came, as he came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead, and he began to weep. He sees Jerusalem, that's the, that's the context, and he begins to weep. Why are you crying, Jesus? And part of the answer to that question is, well, why did God send Jesus? What, what was his purpose? What was at the center of who he was? See, Jesus came to bring life and life more abundantly. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Jesus came to proclaim the good news to the poor, right? To restore sight and to heal and to set the prisoners free. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinners. We're told that he didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. Jesus came to show the love of the Father in heaven to those of us who were broken on earth. So what made Jesus cry? In this text, he looks out over Jerusalem and he sees how wrecked they are apart from God. And that wrecks him. That wrecks Jesus. And he cries out, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, hear his heart, church, the city that kills the prophets and stones the messengers. Now, was Jesus sad because they were killing the prophets and stoning the messengers? The answer is, no, no, that's not why he was sad. That was a truth, a reality of what they were doing. What made him sad uh, was that they were not in relationship with God. They were not allowing God to bring them in close and experience relationship with him. He said this, he said, how often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects its little chicks beneath my wings, but you wouldn't let me. How often, this is what made Jesus cry, how often I wanted to bring you close, I wanted to show you my love, I wanted to comfort you and tell you that you matter to me. But it makes me so sad because I wanted to love you, but you wouldn't let me. What makes Jesus sad? It's when he wants to love you. It's when he wants to protect you. It's when he wants to comfort you, but he can't. We keep him at arm's length. That makes Jesus sad. I wonder what makes you sad. Uh, in the Wicker household, each night, we sit down to dinner, and we do this thing called highs and lows. And we've been doing this for a long time, so it's, it's automatic now. We all sit down to dinner, and highs and lows, somebody start, right? And we go around the table sharing what was our high for the day and what was our low. You have to do it. You can't get out of it. Everybody has to participate. Um, and we take turns going around. It, my high is always, I, I, always right here in this moment. I, I, my high is sitting at the table with you guys right now and eating this delicious meal that your mommy made. That's always my high. It's automatic. I don't have to think about it, which is, which is good, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and then I have to wrestle with, you know, my lows. You, you can't go too low with your kids. Like, well, let me tell you about my lows. No, no. Um, but, we, but for the most part, you know, we're very honest, very honest. And one of my children, who I'm, I'm not going to name them, I'm going to do my best to not name them. They, they said, you know, my low today was that I did not have recess and we're like, yikes, like you, you didn't have recess? I mean, that's a pretty big deal in a, in a kid's world. And uh, um, if, you're, if you're trying to narrow it down, 
Well, you know that it wasn't Allison and I because neither of us have recess, and you know that it was one of our kids. So, and one of our kids is a baby who can't talk. Um, so you're down to three. <laughs> Good luck. Um, you didn't have recess, and we, so we asked, you know, that's a really good low. That's a good low. Like, that would make me sad, too. Why, child, why did you not have recess? And, and this little wicker, uh, he, they said, I spit on somebody. <laughs> okay, so two things happen right there. You want to laugh. You're like, you want to laugh, but you know you shouldn't laugh. And you know that's really bad. Like, it's both. It's, that is awful. But the fact that they said that, right, it kind of it caught me off guard. And my teacher made me walk laps around the field instead of letting me play. And we're like, now that, that's a low, and we need to get to the bottom of that low because that, that really changes, changes things. So we said to our child, you know, thank you for your honesty. I'm so sorry that you didn't get to play on the playground today. I understand that's a low, but we don't spit on our friends. Like, we need to talk about this. I mean, can you imagine just how sad your classmate must feel tonight? I don't know if he does highs and lows, but maybe he's sitting at the table with his family, and his low tonight is that so-and-so, you know, spit on me today at school. And, and I think there was a kind of a, a shared agreement across the table that none of us ever want to be someone else's low. And so, and so we said that, you know, let's never be. Let's, let's strive to never be somebody else's low. In fact, tomorrow... First thing, let's fix that relationship. Let's go in there and say, you know what? Friends don't spit on friends. I'm sorry. Well, really, really cool news. I don't have this in my notes. Really cool news. Teacher doesn't know anything about this, uh, this conversation. And we get an email the next morning. You're not going to believe this, but your child, first thing, came in, went right up to someone and apologized and said, hey, friends don't spit on friends. And uh, that was, woo, I was a proud dad. I was like, I was like, buy that child whatever he wants. Like, she, or he, or she. You're like, whatever they, <laughs> we're down to two. <laughs> so what makes you sad? What brings you joy? For Jesus, we saw that he longs for people to know the Father. And when they don't know the Father, that brings him sadness. And when, when they do know the Father, that brings him joy. So it, I think if, if we were able to invite Jesus over to dinner today at our house and we started on our highs and lows conversation, it might sound a whole lot like the story that we're going to look at in Luke 15, a story that brought the Father great joy. It starts out sad, but it brings him great joy. So if you've got your Bibles, we're reading in Luke 15, where Jesus is telling one of the most famous, like all-time famous stories that, uh, you know, if he was a songwriter, he would have be getting royalties on this for a long time. Um, it's called The Prodigal Son, the story of the prodigal son. And I'll tell you, just in case it's new to you, it's a story of a father who has two sons, and the story is about the love of the father for the two sons. Now, Jesus is arguably the greatest storyteller of all time. And he effortlessly weaves in this fictional earthly story that listeners down through the ages have connected with. And he weaves it into a greater redemption story, a narrative that has a heavenly meaning. And so it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And here in Luke 15... Jesus starts the parable by explaining how one day, the younger son, he says to his father, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm done with your rules. I'm done with this life. I'm done with you people. I'm leaving. Give me my inheritance. You're never going to see me again. I'm out. And uh, now, now, I imagine that a decision like that, you don't arrive at lightly. I'm assuming that this young man had been thinking about this for some time, maybe months, maybe years. We're not sure. The text doesn't tell us. But in this culture, a child will not just go to his father, uh, you know, haphazardly without thinking about it and say, I'm done. Give me my inheritance. Because to say goodbye like that was to say goodbye for good. There was no returning. 
And so he's saying to his dad, very literally, you are dead to me, dad. You're dead to me, and let's just skip the funeral. Let's skip the tears. Just get me, give me what's coming to me. And he's burning every bridge with his father. He's ending this abruptly. And when you think about how arrogant this is, how rebellious and how downright disrespectful he's being, you realize that this boy's heart is as black as sin. It's as ugly as, possible, as it can possibly be. And yet, Jesus tells us that the father responds, okay, you can have your inheritance. You can have your portion of the inheritance. Now, we got to kind of get into the context a little bit here. And you can imagine that as Jesus is telling this story, that all the parents in the temple, they looked down the row at their kids sitting in the pews and they gave them that look. Like, don't you even think about it. You're not getting a dime from me if you try to threaten me, right? Like, I brought you into this world and I'll take you out. Don't think about it. I, I don't know if that's true, but it helps me. And so uh, <laughs> Jesus continues and he tells us that the son, he takes the inheritance. He takes the money. He takes his dad's second car and he peels out of the driveway without so much as a second look in the rear view mirror, just smoke and squealing tires. And he leaves the house and he leaves the town that he grew up in and he leaves the only family he has in the world. He leaves his father standing in their front yard. This, the same front yard that his dad taught him how to ride a bike the same front yard where he taught him how to throw a baseball, that, that same front yard where he learned how to work hard and cut the grass and keep the line straight, boy, the same front yard where they, they, they slept out under the stars and they looked up into the night sky and they discussed the most mysterious of all God's creations, the female mind. <laughs> Taking notes, right, right? And he's leaving a million memories and everything he's ever known, the place that made him. He's leaving his father forever. But Jesus helps us to understand that the boy doesn't care. He's reckless and he's, he's loaded. He, I mean, he's got more money than he knows what to do with and it doesn't take long for this young man to find himself in a big city where he's entranced and hypnotized by the lights and the glitz and the glamour, and he dives in head first into this partying, living it up, you know, a Vegas style without restraints life. And he's got all kinds of new friends, right? Because what happens when you pick up the tab? You get true friends. You get true friends, that's right. And who knows? We don't know how long this Vegas lifestyle lasted, but at some point, Jesus explains that he loses it all. He burns through his inheritance and he blew it all on cocaine and fast cars and even faster women. And he loses absolutely everything as in not a penny to his name. And then Jesus explains the dilemma that the boy faces. Just as his cash ran out, so did his luck. A famine hits the land. And this playboy went from partying to starving, as in no food, no funds, and no friends, because when the money ran out, so did his freeloading friends. And reality kicks him in the chest. And the hunger pains and the cold, sleepless nights on the streets will do that to you. They'll kick you right in the chest. And in a moment of desperation, he hears of a farmer just outside of town who's hiring and so he, he walks across town in his dirty leather jacket and his holy jeans and his mud cake Yeezys, and he asks for a job. C can, I, can you give me something to do? I'll do anything. And the farmer's like, well, you obviously don't know a thing about farming, son, or you wouldn't be wearing that. Not in the farming country. But if you need a job, if you can feed pigs, Anybody can feed pigs. You can't screw up feeding pigs. I'll give you a job, feed the pigs. Now, you and I, we might not understand at this point in the story, Jesus is taking things like to a whole other level. For his, his Jewish audience, 
they would have picked up on this because you and I, we don't have anything against pigs. Right? Amen. Because I, I actually love pigs. You know, I like pigs in a blanket. I like pigs barbecued. I, I like pigs sliced up real thin and served with breakfast. Can somebody say amen to bacon? Amen. Type bacon in the chat. <laughs> Crispy, not soft. That's right. <laughs> we love pigs. But in this original audience, they would have thought, now Jesus, you just took this story one step too far. Right? This kid is really at the bottom. I mean, he's at the bottom of the bottom. It would be the equivalent of you and I applying for a job, cleaning out porta johns, right? But by hand, by hand. Like, and, I, and I've done that, so I'm not, if you, if, I've been at the bottom, right? <laughs> Started at the bottom, but now, I'm, what's that, how's that song going? Anyway, um, it would be the equivalent of just the worst worst possible job that you can imagine. And Jesus explains that there's this famine in the land, and so this, this runaway, he's so hungry that not only is he feeding these filthy hogs, but these thoughts start to ro uh, ro roam through his mind. He's like, you know, is, is pig slop edible? It, are, are these leftovers, rotten food? Is this something I can eat? And it, Jesus is showing us just how desperate this young man is, just how low he finds himself. And to be honest, he's finding himself in a place where he never thought he would be. A place in, in life that, that he had never pictured. He had pictured the high life, right? The, 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 all the things that the beer commercials promise us, right? The high life. But nothing was going according to plan. I wonder if you've ever, have you ever been there? Have you ever been there, that, that place where you realize that nothing is going the way I planned? I was going to do this. I was going to do that. You know, uh, we were going to be married. This, we were never going to get divorced. We, you know, she was going to live. We, we were going to go to heaven together someday, right? Have you ever been at a place where things didn't go the way you planned? Or, or let's take it a step further. Have you ever ended up where you never thought you would be spiritually and emotionally? Like you're walking through life and everything around you looks like it's fine, but you've ended up in a place emotionally or spiritually where you never thought you would be. It's, it's never been this dark. I've never been this far away. My life is off track. You can't see it, but my life is a train wreck. Have you ever been where you never thought you would be? And that's exactly where this boy finds himself. His life is completely bankrupt, he's spent, and he's used. And, and there's nothing left for him but the closing credits. Have you ever, I wonder, have you ever felt that lost? And, uh, this boy goes from the penthouse to the pig pen, and now he's just trying to stay alive. Just trying to survive, and, and sometimes, when we hit rock bottom, the worst thing seems like the only possible thing. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And we're tempted to do the unimaginable. And it's interesting how the enemy plays with our minds. And Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 15, verse 17, that this is a powerful moment in the boy's life. It woke him up. It brought him back to his senses. He says, when he came to his senses, when the boy came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants, they've got food to spare, and here I am starving to death. And he realizes in a moment of clarity that I have been so wrong. Life is better with the father. And he knew that he messed up. He knew that he'd hurt the father. And he knew in his mind, that this relationship was forever broken. But I'm so encouraged that he didn't stop there. And this is the sad part. So many people, they find themselves in this exact place in life where they're lost and they're broke, broken and they're hopeless and they think, you know, I've, I've just made too many mistakes. I've broken too many things. I, I, I've sinned too deeply, there, there's no fixing it, there's no repairing it, it's wrecked. 
And they end up doing things that make their situation and the, situ the situation around them for everyone else so much worse. But as Jesus is telling this story, he points out that when this boy hit rock bottom, it was there that he finally came to his senses. And he's like, what if I go back home? What if, just what if I go back home? In verse 20, Jesus says, so he got up and he went to his father. You wanna know what brings Jesus great joy? <laughs> it's when you take one step toward your father. That brings great joy to your father. Tell somebody next to you, take one step. Take a step. Type it there in the chat, take a step. You gotta get up, you gotta take a step. It brings joy to the father. And that's what this boy did. He decided to take a step. And so he got up from the filth and he started going home. Do you see that he was surrounded by grace? What looked like filth was the father's grace. And he, he, he stands up and he takes a step. And watch what happens. Watch what the father does when the prodigal son takes one step towards him. In verse 20, it says, but while the son was still a far way off, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And then my Bible says that he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. They say that a, that a picture is worth a thousand words. I think this painting that Jesus is creating for us is, is worth 10,000 words because, listen, you don't see what you're not looking for. And let, me, let me try to explain that. The only reason the father saw the son is because he was looking for him. He was looking for the son. And the text says, while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him. He saw him because he was looking. And you want to know what brings great joy to God? It's when you and I start to walk towards him. It's when the prodigal, wa hey, watch this. It's when the prodigal in you starts to take a step towards Jesus. And this boy's thinking, man, I have messed it up. There is no way. There's, 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 there's no way the father is going to accept me. And so he has an apology speech all planned out. He's like, no, I just know I'm going to be. I'm like, Dad, I know I'm the last person in the world that you thought you would see today. I know that I hurt you. And I wish I could take it all back. I was wrong. I don't deserve it. And I would completely understand if you said no, but I'm starving would you hire me? Would you give me a job? And here we finally see the picture that Jesus is trying to show us. It's the whole point of the story, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus tells us that while the boy was still a long way off, the father sees him. And so he drops his coffee and his newspaper in the front yard. That that same front yard where they had spent countless hours playing as a little boy, that same front yard where he heard his son say, I wish you were dead, and drove off with a cloud of dust. And guess who runs? The father runs. The father runs through his yard to his son. In fact, it's the only time in the entire Bible that we see God running, and he's running towards his son. And he's running for his son. And the boy is filthy and he's stinky and he hasn't bathed in weeks. But his father throws his arms around him and he hugs him and he kisses him and he loves him. And he's overjoyed that his son who was lost is found. His son who was dead is alive and says, he says, go get, go get my best robe Go, go get a ring and a pair of sandals and put them on my son because I'm going to cover up this boy. 
I'm going to repair what can't be repaired. I'm going to fix what can't be fixed. I'm going to redeem what can't be redeemed. I'm going to make it right. And I so love this picture because Jesus is telling you and me, we don't have to come to the Father fixed. We just have to come to the Father. And the Father is elated. And he's celebrating and he tells the people in the town, come celebrate. My boy's coming home. My son has come home. Now, this would seem like the perfect place to end the story to me, Jesus. Like, let's just end with the party. But the story isn't over. And we've seen what makes Jesus sad and we've seen what brings him joy. But there's more. And Jesus goes on. Remember that there were two sons. And so the older one. He's on his way home from work, and he hears the party, and he hears the cheering, and he hears the music, and he's like, what is going on in my father's house? And in verse 26, we read, so he calls to one of the servants, and he asks them, what's going on? And apparently the servant replies that your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back home safe and sound. Your brother, the one that we thought was dead, He's alive. The one who ran away from home, he's back home. And and you would think that the older son, the one who had stayed home with his father, that he would be excited, but he isn't. Verse 28 tells us that the older brother became angry and he refused to go in. And so his father went out to him and he pleaded with him, come join the celebration. But this older brother, he didn't care that the younger brother was alive. And apparently he didn't share the same feelings of the father, which makes me wonder, where was this older brother's heart? What was going on in his heart? See, is it possible that we can be physically close to God, that we can be in church and we can be emotionally distant from the Father? Is it, is it possible that it's too easy to point fingers that are people that are physically far away from God and miss out on our emotional distance? I mean, you can come to church every week and you can give faithfully and you can serve and you can, you can turn a relationship into a list of rules. And, and you can turn it into checking off the box When Jesus is making so clear in the story today that what brings him joy is relationship. And uh, Jesus wants you to know that it brings him joy when you take a step. It brings him joy, brings God the, the Father joy. But if you're wondering, do I bring you joy? Do are you proud of me? Jesus goes out to the son who's been with him all this time and is emotionally distant and he invites him to the party because this second brother mattered. And your emotional closeness or your your relationship with God matters. You matter to God. You bring God joy. So the father, he loves his rebellious son And he loves his rule-following son. He he loves them both. And in verse 31, he tries to tell his older son this very exact thing. He says, my son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. So, So don't underestimate your value. Don't underestimate who you are to me. Everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate it's time to be glad because your, your son, your brother, who was dead, he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And I think so many times people view following Jesus as a set of rules that they have to abide by. And if that's the case, we're missing the point. Maybe we're emotionally distanced from God and we're no longer sharing, what? oh, this is good, the same joys. We're no longer sharing the same joys as our father. We we don't have that true relationship with him because if we did, joy is the outcome. Joy is the outcome. What brings the father joy brings the child joy. And isn't it interesting 
that the sadness of Jesus and the joy of Jesus have one thing in common, and it is relationship. And I wonder, especially in this season, there might be some of you that are isolated and you're doing life alone. You're like, man, I don't have anything to celebrate. I don't have any joy. I don't have anything motivating me. And I want to encourage you. I want to invite you to come closer to the Father, to come closer in relationship. If you've physically distanced yourself from God, let me invite you, take a step towards the Father. It will bring him joy. It will bring you joy. If you're here and you're emotionally distant from the Father, let me remind you that for him, for God, it was never about your checks in the boxes and doing the right things. It was about your, re your relationship, your proximity to the heart of the Father. And here is what I know with all my heart is that if you're a runaway today, your party-throwing father is running towards you. And if you're the older son, and, and he's inviting you into the party, he's inviting you to share in his joy. See, Jesus experienced sadness, and Jesus experienced joy, all in the context of relationship. Would you pray with me, church? Heavenly Father, I pray right now in this moment that there would be clarity in our hearts. Search our hearts and teach us how to cling to you, how to hear your voice. What is it that you're saying to me? Is there an area in my life where I need to repent? Is there a change that needs to happen in my heart? Lord, bring us ever closer to you. We need you. If you're here today and you say, Josh, I am that prodigal Jesus talked about. Like this whole message was for me. My prayer is that God would speak to you and that you would know that no matter what you've done, you can always return to your heavenly father. Because here's the good news. The moment you step towards the father, he runs towards you. And you say, I have a hard time believing that. I can't believe that. Maybe he runs towards other people, but I've done so many things I'm ashamed of, so many things that God could never forgive. I don't believe that he would ever run towards me. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that he is and that he has been for all of your life. And the cross proves it. Just look at the cross where the Son of God bled and died, not because of something he had done, but because of what you and I had done. He died on the cross for my sins and for your sins. See, he could have just shouted his love from heaven, but he decided to show his love on earth. He ran towards us. And he did it so that today you could experience a relationship with him meant to last forever. God the Father wants to cover your filth and your sin with Christ's robe of righteousness. He wants to fix and redeem everything you've messed up. If today you want to begin a relationship with God, I can tell you this, it will bring great joy to God. He's been waiting for you. He's been waiting for this day. He's been watching and looking for you to run to him. In fact, the Bible tells me that all of heaven rejoices when just one person comes home. This morning, it would be my joy to pray with you right here and right now in this room or in line and give you a chance to tell God, I'm coming home. Be Lord of my life. If that's your prayer, would you lift your hand right now and pray with me? Heavenly Father, if you're online, you can click to connect. Connect with the Father. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus, only you can save me. Only you can find me. Only you can change me. I give my life to you. Now you have mine. Thank you for a love I don't deserve. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you were to ask the Anavitarte household, which is my family, my wife and I, what are top two favorite books would be. The first book would obviously be the Bible. The second book 
we would list as the insanity of God. I don't know if you guys have ever read that before or even heard of that title. It's an incredible book that tells the story of a man who is in a family who are missionary families over in Africa and then ultimately Somalia who go through some of the most intense persecution and, and stress and turmoil in their lives only to find out that there is a common theme that is woven through the lives of every believer that is in persecution. They go to Russia, they go to China, they go to the underground church in various places and they figure out that the common theme, and it's a bracelet that I normally wear but don't have on today, but um, it is that Jesus is worth it. No matter what the sacrifice, no matter what the suffering is, Jesus is worth it. Well, the movie The Insanity of God came out several years ago and uh, on a songwriting trip that I was on, got an opportunity to meet the author of the book, Nick Ripkin. Uh, he and his family have become extremely close friends of ours, and at the same time, we wrote a song together called, Is He Worth It? Based on the book, based on his experiences, and we wrote the song and we recorded the song, and my team did a fantastic job of doing that, and then all of a sudden COVID hits. It's like, well, what do we do with the song? And the Lord just kept telling us, just release the song. And so we released the song, and um, to make a long story short, um, Lifeway, Fathom Media heard the song, and they thought, this is incredible. We want to take this song, we want to take it to another level. This is all God's stuff. And so we just said, well, we'll just keep going and see where this goes. And they said, well, you guys want to do a, a video? And I said, cool. Nobody has any money to do any videos, but sure, let's do a video. <laughs> and so... Um, Funds started coming in and generating some support for that. So my video team in Nashville did a fantastic job. It was so incredible that LifeWay and Fathom Media, they said, we're gonna release this. When the movie comes back out, movie theaters open back up, this is gonna be front and center. So Nick Ripkin was excited about it. His team was excited about it. And we said, well, that's great, let's keep going. And so we're gonna do PR. We're gonna do like real PR campaign for this song. And I said, well, it's great. We don't have any money. <laughs> but that's never been a barrier to God. In fact, I wanna encourage you today to just simply say that God, our savior, Jesus Christ, he is pandemic proof. When he wants to accomplish something, there's no pandemic, there's no government, there's no restrictions that will stop him from accomplishing his work. And so this song has gone to great heights. And so I was talking with my video team this week and I said, hey, I'm gonna be in Florida. I would love to debut this song the actual video that's going to be shown. It's going to be released for the public on March 15th. But I'd love to show it to you guys today. And as you guys well know, there was an ice storm and snowstorm in Nashville this week. I have a daily show called the Erskine Music Show, and that is what it is. On Tuesday on the show, a seven-year-old gets on my show and she says, hey, can you pray for my dad? He's in the hospital. Who's your dad? Oh, your dad is the videographer. What happened? And so I finished my show and I get on the phone and he had slipped on the ice, he had fallen down some stairs, he had punctured his lung, and he was in the hospital. And so we've been praying for him all week. Um, his name is Johnny. And so I don't have the video today, but I have the lyric video. On March the 15th, the actual video is coming out for the public. And so this song is called, Is He Worth It? And no matter what the circumstances are in our lives, I just wanna remind you guys this morning that Jesus is worth it. Let's keep pressing on. This is no game, it's no fairy tale. I stared right into a rifle barrel. It all comes down to this. Is he worth it? This is no dream. It's reality, they stole my love and my dignity. It all comes down to this, is he worth it? This is where faith lives or dies. This is where hope comes alive. Be the price, I be the price. Love demands a sacrifice I'll give what I can't keep To gain what I can't lose Count the cost, count the cost It's a privilege to bear the cross No matter what I face, my heart 
heart is certain that he's worth it. Oh, oh, this is no play. It's no Sunday school. Just give up now. Don't be a fool. They jeered and laughed and said, is he worth it? This is no lie. They stole my child, they give her back if I didn't just deny. And the road seems long ahead. Is he worth it? Pay the price, pay the price. This love demands a sacrifice. I'll give what I can't give. To gain what I can lose. Count the cost, count the cost. It's a privilege to bear the cross No matter what I face, my heart is certain Life is gonna ask you to make a choice Give it all away for a great joy Nothing's better than Jesus When the heavens open up and we see your face Stand the day and we're gonna say he was worth everything. Be the price. This love demands a sacrifice. I'll give what I can't give. To gain what I can do. Count the cost. Count the cost. It's a privilege to bear the cross. No matter what I face, my heart is certain. No matter what I fix, my heart is certain that it's worth it. Oh, oh, Jesus is worth it. Oh, oh, oh. Amen. Amen. Hey, can we all stand together? Can we all stand together? Thank you so much, Erskine. I, want, I, just, I just want to remind us on our way out, let's, uh, let's show some love uh, to our brother here and make sure you stop by, say hello to him, and, and uh, buy three hats and six shirts. You were made to shine. You were made to shine. Heavenly Father, we, we just, over this, over this moment, just right now, I, my heart is impressed just to pray and to say to you what Erskine so eloquently said, that you are worth it. It will be worth it all when we see you, and even right now, you're worth it.